Hello, everybody. This is Margaret Harris at the WHO headquarters in Geneva. Welcome to our COVID-19 press briefing today, this Monday, July 20. As usual, we'll be providing simul simultaneous translation in all six languages, uh, of the, all six UN languages, plus Portuguese. And you may also listen in Hindi. Uh, note, owing to the way Zoom is set up, you will have to go to the button marked Korean to access Arabic. We are, are have been having some connectivity problems today, so we apologize if there are any problems. We will ensure that we keep it going on Zoom, but there may be some problems uh, with our social media connection. Uh, and now I will hand over to Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Although people of all walks of life are affected by COVID-19, the world's poorest and most vulnerable people are especially at risk. That's true of indigenous peoples all over the world in urban or remote areas. There are up to 500 million indigenous peoples worldwide in over 90 countries. Indigenous peoples have unique cultures and languages and keep deep relationships with the environment. Like other vulnerable groups, indigenous peoples face many challenges. This includes a lack of political representation, economic marginalization, and lack of access to health, education, and social services. Indigenous peoples often have a high burden of poverty, unemployment, malnutrition, and both communicable and non-communicable diseases, making them more vulnerable to COVID-19 and its severe outcomes. Although COVID-19 is a risk for all indigenous peoples globally, WHO is deeply concerned about the impact of the virus on indigenous peoples in the Americas, which remains the current epicenter of the pandemic. As of the 6th of July, more than 70,000 cases have been reported among indigenous peoples in the Americas and more than 2,000 deaths. Most recently, at least six cases have been reported among the Nahua people who live in Peruvian Amazon. WHO's regional office for the Americas recently published recommendations for preventing and responding to COVID-19 among indigenous peoples. The WHO is also working with the coordinator of indigenous organizations of the Amazon River Basin to step up the fight against COVID-19. One of the key tools for suppressing transmission in indigenous communities and all communities is contact tracing. No country can get control of its epidemic if it doesn't know where the virus is. As we have said many times, so-called lockdown measures can help to reduce transmission, but they cannot completely stop it. Contact tracing is essential for finding and isolating cases and identifying and quarantining their contacts. Mobile applications can support contact tracing, but nothing replaces boots on the ground trained workers going door to door to find cases and contacts and break the chains of transmission. Contact tracing is essential for every country in every situation. It can prevent individual cases from becoming clusters and clusters turning into community transmission. Even countries with community transmission can make progress by breaking down their epidemics into manageable parts. This is all the more critical as countries are opening up. Reacting rapidly to new cases and clusters will allow countries to continue on the road to economic recovery while keeping the virus at bay. Of course, contact tracing is not the only tool. It must be part of a comprehensive package, but it's one of the most important. Contact tracing has long been 
the bedrock of outbreak response from smallpox to polio to Ebola and COVID-19. One of the lessons from the recent Ebola outbreak in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, which was declared over last month, is that contact tracing can be done even in the most difficult circumstances with security problems. When Ebola was discovered in the city of Butembo last year, experts wondered whether it would be possible to bring the outbreak under control. But against all odds, the outbreak was stopped in large part because the government, WHO, and partners invested heavily in contact tracing, isolating suspected cases, and treating those that became sick. Over and over again, trained contact tracers working closely with local leaders and communities tracked the virus, sometimes over hundreds of miles in very difficult terrain. Ebola and COVID-19 are different viruses, but the principle is the same. No matter how bad the situation, there is always hope. With strong leadership, community engagement, and a comprehensive strategy to suppress transmission and save lives, COVID-19 can be stopped. We do not have to wait for a vaccine. We have to save lives now. Make no mistake, we must continue to accelerate vaccine research while doing more with the tools we have at hand. To talk more about the importance of contact tracing, both in the context of COVID-19 and Ebola, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sose Fall, WHO's Assistant Director General for Emergency Response, and Dr. Mori Keita, who is the Incident Manager coordinating WHO's fieldwork in the Democratic Republic of the Congo for the current Ebola outbreak in the west of the country. Dr. Fall and Dr. Keita, welcome. And Margaret, uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. And as Dr. Tedros has underlined so powerfully, good contact tracing is key, key to stopping even a huge outbreak like this. But what is not so well understood is how it is done and why it matters so much. So Dr. Fall is now going to engage in a dialogue with me to explain exactly why. I'm going to ask the questions in English because I don't want the interpreters to have to put up with my terrible French, but Dr. Fall is kindly going to answer in French. So the first question is, so why does it really matter? Why does contact tracing matter so much? Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Didi. I'm going to speak slowly in French to allow interpreter to be able to, to follow me. Donc, euh, je pense que c'est une question très importante parce que depuis le début de cette pandémie, nous mettons l'accent sur l'importance du suivi des contacts. Il faut rappeler que l'objectif du suivi des contacts, c'est de pouvoir détecter très rapidement les cas secondaires donc qui sont issus de la transmission avec des cas déjà connus. Et le fait donc de rechercher et de suivre ces contacts, parce qu'il y a un effort de recherche qu'il faut d'abord faire. Et le fait de les rechercher et de les suivre permet donc de rompre la chaîne de transmission, parce que ces cas, ces contacts, quand ils deviennent des cas, n'ont pas le temps de transmettre la maladie à la population. Donc le fait d'assurer un suivi des contacts permet de réduire l'incidence de la maladie à COVID-19. Et en réduisant l'incidence de la maladie, cela veut dire aussi qu'on réduit la propagation de la maladie. Et comme vous le savez, le fait de détecter les cas suffisamment tôt permet aussi de leur donner plus de chances de survie. Donc, en faisant le suivi des contacts, nous sauvons des vies. Merci beaucoup. Deuxième question. Second question. Can you tell us exactly how it works and what makes it successful? And what are the things that make contact tracing fail? Many countries are struggling so much. What is it, what is it they need to really know how to do and what to look out for? In fact, it is important to understand 
que le suivi des contacts n'est pas une intervention isolée. Le suivi des contacts fait partie des meilleures pratiques de l'investigation épidémiologique. Donc, si un pays ne fait pas l'effort, l'investissement nécessaire pour l'investigation épidémiologique, bien entendu, le suivi des contacts va être problématique. Et c'est à partir d'une investigation de qualité qu'on peut identifier les contacts et même parfois les contacts des contacts pour minimiser le risque de transmission. Donc, il est important de répertorier les contacts et même de cartographier les contacts. Cela nous donne une idée de l'effort qu'il faut faire pour pouvoir aller visiter les contacts au jour le jour et donc de planifier les aspects opérationnels en conséquence. Et, mais au jour le jour aussi, il faut assurer un, un suivi régulier pour guetter l'apparition des symptômes de la maladie. Et cela permet donc d'être rapide en termes d'isolement, en termes de, de dépistage et aussi en termes de traitement approprié. Et c'est une intervention qui, qui est connue de longue date. Et donc, le Dr Tedros a parlé de la variole, c'est une des interventions aussi qui a permis d'éradiquer la variole. Mais quand on regarde les épidémies les plus récentes, pour, avec des virus même beaucoup plus mortels que, que le COVID-19 ou le SARS-CoV-2, nous avons pu donc, euh, maîtriser ces épidémies en faisant donc, un suivi de contact rigoureux avec des performances excellentes. Pour citer l'exemple de l'épidémie de peste pulmonaire à Madagascar en fin 2017, vous savez, la peste pulmonaire se transmet beaucoup plus rapidement que donc, euh, la COVID-19 et le temps d'incubation est des fois de 24 heures. Donc, vous devez être rapide. Et donc, c'était très risqué. Et quand vous ne traitez pas suffisamment à temps, la létalité est en 30 et 100 Mais avec un suivi rigoureux des contacts, nous avons pu maîtriser cette épidémie avec le pays, bien entendu. Et plus récemment, l'exemple de l'épidémie virus Ebola au nord Kivu, au sud Kivu et en Ituri, dans un contexte de conflit, où quand nous sommes arrivés donc, euh, à une localité comme Boutembo, les chaînes de transmission étaient presque partout. Mais avec un engagement de la communauté, une décentralisation efficace donc, des opérations, nous avons pu donc, euh, avoir des opérations totalement décentralisées et au bout du compte, nous sommes arrivés à maîtriser cette épidémie. Donc, pour réussir en suivi des contacts, l'idéal, c'est une bonne préparation, parce qu'on n'attend pas une période de crise pour commencer à planifier. Mais malheureusement, nous avons vu que beaucoup de pays ne sont pas arrivés à ce stade, n'ont pas été très bien préparés pour faire ce suivi des contacts. La plupart des pays, surtout les pays les plus développés, avaient un système de surveillance centré sur les hôpitaux. Mais quand les malades arrivent à l'hôpital, il est déjà trop tard parce qu'ils ont eu le temps de contaminer les personnes dans la communauté. Donc il est important d'avoir une assise communautaire solide parce que chaque individu, chaque communauté, chaque personne dans la communauté doit se protéger, mais aussi protéger les autres personnes. Et c'est en faisant une bonne communication de risque, en renforçant les capacités des membres de la communauté qu'on peut avoir donc, des performances à ce niveau. Cela suppose aussi une bonne supervision avec des acteurs plus spécialisés qui travaillent avec les différentes communautés. Donc, en quelque sorte, il faut combiner aussi bien la surveillance à base communautaire avec la surveillance hospitalière. C'est ce qui permet d'avoir un système complet pour faire le suivi des contacts. Merci. But if it gets... so, when it becomes such a huge outbreak over such a large area and so many cases, doesn't there get to become a point where it's impossible? Vous savez, dans la lutte contre les épidémies, c'est une question de sauver des vies. On ne peut pas abdiquer, on ne peut pas abandonner. You can't give up. C'est pour ça que dans les conditions extrêmement difficiles, donc au Congo, au Kivu, où nous avons enregistré plus de 1700 incidents sécuritaires, où nous avons eu des attaques directes au niveau des acteurs et des formations et, et, et des partenaires. Nous sommes restés pour faire le suivi des contacts. À un moment donné, des experts renommés ont commencé à se dire que Ebola est endémique, vous ne pouvez pas l'arrêter, vous ne pouvez pas arrêter la transmission. Mais avec une décentralisation efficace, avec un engagement des communautés qui ont été vraiment les, les forces de première ligne, nous sommes arrivés donc, à maîtriser cette épidémie et mais il est important aussi de tenir compte des différents contextes. Même quand on atteint un niveau de transmission communautaire soutenu, il est possible d'avoir une, 
une approche géographique en, en considérant certaines zones spécifiques comme des zones où pratiquement tout le monde est en contact. Mais en même temps, quand on a des limites donc du suivi de contact dans ces zones où la transmission communautaire est forte, il faut combiner le suivi des contacts avec la recherche active des cas, aussi bien dans la communauté que dans les formations sanitaires. Donc encore une fois, ce n'est pas une intervention isolée. So say one more question. There's new technology now. We've got apps many countries are using. Surely those can replace the people that you use for contact tracing. Il est très important de, de, de tirer avantage de, nouvel, de nouvelles technologies parce que ça nous permet d'avoir de l'information à, à temps réel. Par exemple, à Béni, quand on était à la fin de l'épidémie en introduisant une, un outil que nous avons appelé le Go Data, nous étions en mesure d'avoir les informations sur l'état des contacts à mi-journée. Avant l'introduction de cet outil, il nous fallait attendre toute la journée, le soir, pour compiler les données et savoir où est-ce qu'on en était. Donc on peut agir pratiquement à temps réel pour corriger les insuffisances. Mais l'outil ne pourra jamais remplacer l'homme. Nous avons besoin de la, donc des membres de la communauté bien informés, bien formés pour faire du porte-à-porte -porte et aller visiter et donc, euh, les contacts. Et dans des situations où ces visites ne sont pas possibles, donc la technologie est toujours nécessaire. On peut envoyer des messages, SMS, des messages WhatsApp, appeler et discuter avec les contacts. Mais pour avoir donc une analyse efficace de ces informations, il faut toujours ces ressources humaines. Et il faut en suivi des performances donc entre les acteurs de santé et la communauté de façon transparente pour s'assurer qu'on est sur la bonne direction. Une dernière question. In the absence of vac a vaccine, th a specific therapeutic, is it really possible to stop an outbreak like this just with public health tools, interventions? Merci beaucoup. Je pense que les vaccins et les médicaments sont aussi des outils de santé publique. Mais comme Dr. Tabros l'a dit dans l'introduction, les pays ne vont pas attendre donc l'arrivée du vaccin pour commencer à sauver des vies. Maintenant, avec les outils disponibles. Nous pouvons sauver des vies et nous devons continuer à le faire tout en accélérant la recherche sur les traitements et sur le vaccin. Nous avons beaucoup d'exemples de maladies avec des pathogènes dangereux qui ont pu être donc maîtrisés avant même l'arrivée du vaccin. Même si on retourne à Ebola en Afrique de l'Ouest en 2014, le vaccin n'existait pas. Avec un suivi des contacts et toutes les autres interventions de santé publique, nous avons pu maîtriser l'épidémie. Nous avons l'exemple du Mars, nous avons l'exemple de la fièvre à virus Marbourg, la fièvre de Lassa, Nipah virus. Donc, beaucoup d'exemples et avec des interventions de santé publique efficaces. Donc, en testant les cas, en testant de plus en plus, en isolant les cas, en faisant le suivi des contacts et toutes les mesures d'hygiène, les mesures barrières, nous pouvons sauver des vies. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Dr. Farr. Uh, Dr. Mori Keita is trying to join as well, but we haven't been able to get him yet, but we will go to him with any questions um, if he can join. Can he join? No. no. Okay, no, we, uh, we'll go to questions now. So we will now start with Nina from AFP. Nina, please go ahead, unmute yourself and go Just ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Very can you well. hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, the uh, Lancet published two studies today indicating that um, there are two vaccine candidates that um, have been proven safe for humans and also uh, produce strong immune reactions among uh, patients. What is the significance of these findings, do you think? Thank you very much. Um. Great. Uh, thanks. No, I, I, I think uh, it, is, uh, it is good news. I mean, effectively, we have 23 COVID-19 candidate vaccines in clinical development. And as of today, we add one candidate vaccine for which phase one clinical data is available. So we have three, uh, which is available in peer review journals. Plus, <clears throat> we have uh, one other, uh, the BioNTech uh, 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 Pfizer product, which uh, the data is available on, on, on pre-publication. So it's great, first of all, to see the data coming through into peer-reviewed journals. Uh, I think the, the data is very, is very new. <clears throat> uh, we do welcome uh, the, the study and congratulate uh, our colleagues at the Oxford University's uh, Jenner Institute 
uh, and the Oxford Vaccine Group and, and, and obviously our, our colleagues at AstraZeneca for, <coughs> for getting this data out there. Uh, again, uh, in a, this vaccine was given to 1,000 um, healthy adults between the ages of 18 and 55. Uh, and certainly did not appear to have any serious adverse events other than the uh, expected, in some cases, chills, uh, muscle aches, headaches. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the vaccine uh, did uh, generate neutralizing antibody, I think, in, in all participants. Um, and uh, in a very small number of participants that were given a booster dose, uh, those uh, responses were even uh, greater. So in generating T cell mediated uh, responses and generating neutralizing antibody. Uh, this, this is a positive result. But again, there is a long way to go. These are phase one studies. We now need to move into larger scale real world trials, but it is good to see more data uh, and more products moving into this very important phase uh, of uh, vaccine uh, discovery. And we congratulate our colleagues for the progress they have made. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. The next question is from Gabriella from El Progreso. Uh, Gabriella, can you unmute yourself and please go ahead? Yes. Hola. Hola. <laughs> okay. Um, sí, es uh, para proceso. Um, yeah. Um, están diciendo que eh, usted. 70 mil casos eh, en las Américas. Me llamaban Perú, pero eh, me gustaría saber qué otras zonas de las Américas ustedes eh, les causan. Y eh, también porque tengo entendido que Ningún país en, en América Latina está haciendo rastreo de contactos de manera efectiva. Y tampoco se sabe exacto el número. Yo creo que esa cifra está estimada. ¿Qué, ¿Qué se puede hacer en esta región para proteger a los pueblos indígenas? De aquí a que se puede hacer el rastreo. Thank you, Gabriella. That was three questions. I'll remind journalists to try to stick to one, but fortunately, we have the expertise here. Well, we hope so. Um, the, uh, the, the situation across uh, Latin America in general still remains uh, <clears throat> uh, pretty much all countries have uh, some level or other of, of, of community transmission. The numbers uh, are stable. In a, in a number of uh, countries, but continue to rise, uh, continue to rise in, in, in others. Uh, we've had <clears throat> difficult situations in, in Bolivia and Colombia and, 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 and in many other countries where numbers have, um, have increased over the, the last uh, couple of weeks. So I would say overall the situation <clears throat> in Latin America is one of uh, continued threat, continued community transmission uh, of disease. But many countries are fighting back, many countries are, are really uh, trying to, to deal with that at national and subnational level, uh, putting in place uh, targeted um, lockdown, targeted public health measures, and and uh, and many are still at, uh, trying very hard to do uh, contact tracing uh, and cluster-based investigations. And I think th th this is a challenge for many countries. When when you're in the face of full-blown community transmission, and there are literally hundreds, thousands of cases a day. It is very difficult, as Sose said, to keep doing uh, case finding and contact tracing <clears throat> and testing the right people and investigating clusters. And very often in those situations, the measures that work are really community-based measures in creating social distance between people, in some places targeted lockdowns. The trick is very often maintaining your contact tracing so that when the numbers do drop, that you're ready then when the numbers are under some kind of control, that your system is ready then when the numbers are lower to react to new cases, to react to new clusters. You can't just not do contact tracing and then do it perfectly. It takes muscle memory. It takes the system being able to act and build its confidence and build its efficiency. It, 
uh, so say will <clears throat> Uh, remember of many, many outbreaks where it's taken time to build the efficiency of the surveillance system and of contact tracing. It's not just something you switch on and switch off because it requires a partnership between the community, the public health service. It's very often happening over a large geographic area and you're trying to detect signals of transmission and respond. Um, and for countries coming out of lockdowns with low numbers of cases, the real way of avoiding going back into lockdown is sustained community commitment to physical distancing, hygiene and mask wearing and the other local measures that are in place, matched with a very strong government-led uh, program of public health surveillance, case finding, contact tracing, testing, quarantine. It's a system, as, as, as Sose said. It's not just one activity. It requires um, uh, a complex partnership between different services in order to make that happen. And it is hugely important that we continue to invest in <clears throat> surveillance and contact tracing, and particularly uh, in the Americas right now. We need to build that capacity. Uh, again, Latin America was the, the first region in the world to uh, eliminate measles. It was the first region in the world to eliminate polio. Uh, the Public Health Service infectious disease epidemiology is very strong in Latin America and has proven in the past to be very strong. Uh, but it requires, and we all, all over the world, need to make a new commitment to public health surveillance and to building that capacity. Uh, I've used the analogy for some countries with lower levels of COVID-19. Uh, a new cluster of cases of COVID-19 is like a major incident. If you had a major incident, if you had a bad uh, accident uh, on a motorway, it doesn't take three days to mount a response. The response is immediate, and I think we need to really up our game collectively around the world and our reaction to cases and clusters of disease. But it is understandable <clears throat> in situations that countries find themselves in when there's a very high force of infection, maintaining contact tracing for every single case can prove hugely challenging. But we should, never, we should never give up on that. In terms of uh, indigenous uh, populations, I don't know, Maria, if you want to uh, add in on that. Uh, yes, just, just, just to specifically mention on the indigenous um, population. So uh, PAHO has recently issued guidance on the 15th of July on um, specifically on prevention and control measures for indigenous peoples. Um, and, and in there discusses the, the need and the importance of a complete engagement of community leaders of indigenous peoples, an engagement of, of all of the population for information sharing, information exchange, I should say, so listening both ways, making sure language is appropriate, making sure culture is taken into account, to ensure that surveillance is taking place, to ensure that contact tracing is taking place, um, and that it's done in an appropriate way. So in situations, if, if communities are isolated or are remote and testing uh, is not available rapidly um, that, and you can't have a confirmation done very quickly, then um, suspect cases should be considered as probable and the process of contact tracing should, should take place. Um, and that anyone who is a contact, who is placed in quarantine, should be supported through that quarantine. Ensuring, and this is true for all, all people who are in quarantine, to ensure that people are given proper information, that they have contact with their loved ones, physically distant from their loved ones, but still remaining socially connected, that they have food, that they have security, that they're cared for in a safe manner. Um, but there's a whole guidance that has been issued by, by PAHO on the 15th, which goes through all of the different measures from surveillance, through laboratory measures, through contact tracing, through support and care of, of indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. Dr. Sosa. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, just to, to highlight that any time during the response you can have some tactical operational adjustment, it does not mean that you have reached community transmission that you cannot do contact tracing anymore because giving up on contact tracing means giving up on investigation. And if you give up on investigation, it means you don't know which direction you are heading to. And you might find yourself in a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question um, goes to Kai Kufischmidt. Kai, could you unmute yourself and go ahead? Yes, thanks a lot, Margaret, for taking my question. So um, I really wanted to ask a little bit about 
you know, where we are at in terms of ensuring this equitable distribution of vaccines? I mean, given, you know, the positive news about vaccine candidates, and, and we all know that a lot of, you know, what the decisions that are made now are going to be pivotal to, to see whether this vaccine actually reaches those poorest and most vulnerable people that you've talked about. So could you give me an idea of what exactly needs to be done at the moment to ensure that? Um, thanks, Kai. Uh, well, it's a, as, uh, as you know, uh, it, it is a, it's a complex challenge. Uh, obviously, first of all, we've got to get the candidate vaccines through the system, and, and what WHO has been doing is working with partners to ensure that we have the maximum number of candidate vaccines and trying to level that playing field so that uh, all potential candidates can be moved through the phase one and phase two cycles of, um, of, of trials, and that is to remove barriers to that in terms of access to testing, access to assays, um, and, and ultimately, potentially, uh, even access to vaccine uh, trial platforms, and that's what we've obviously tried to do with the solidarity trials for therapeutics. So WHO is working to try and ensure that we have the maximum number of candidates coming through the system, and obviously working with our colleagues in CEPI and, G and Gabi and, and, and people within the um, other organizations contributing to the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. Uh, the second part of that is really getting to a point where we can have scaled up production of the, uh, any candidate vaccine that shows clinical efficacy or even scaling up production in advance. And you've seen a number of examples of uh, support to uh, companies and, and, and researchers to begin even very, very soon the production of vaccine at risk uh, to ensure that there will be adequate or would be at least initial supplies of vaccine available should a, a signal of clinical eff efficacy emerge. Um, the, the challenge uh, is going to be uh, when vaccines do prove clinically efficacious, uh, ensuring that there's enough production to be able to supply the needs around the world. And that is in itself the, the, the big question. Uh, there are a number of different consortia that have been created uh, in, in, the, in the UK, within the European Union and uh, in the US that are trying to ensure supplies for, for those populations. But uh, more importantly, we have the COVAX initiative, which is a, uh, again an initiative of the ACT Accelerator, which seeks to bring together a whole series of countries, both uh, <clears throat> countries who will uh, be traditionally uh, clients of, of Gavi, but countries well beyond that, to try and create an alliance, of, uh, in a sense, a consortium that comes together to pre-purchase and advance purchase vaccines uh, within a system allowing for fair and equitable distribution amongst uh, those countries. Uh, there is. <clears throat> um, um, it is not that mechanism at it presently stands is not going to be able to supply a vaccine for everybody on the planet. Uh, we are going to have to prioritize who gets what vaccine uh, at the beginning, depending on which vaccine becomes available. Uh, and we're going to have to have some policy and priorities around the best use of those vaccines. Uh, our colleagues within the ACT uh, Accelerator, the different institutions, uh, and our colleagues within WHO are working very, very hard on, on the appropriate allocation mechanisms to ensure that those vaccines are distributed in the, safe, or in the most equitable way possible. But there are significant challenges and headwinds in order to ensure scaled up production and ensuring that that scaled up production results in, uh, in, in as many people as possible around the world having access to that vaccine. Part of that does depend on more countries joining in that COVAX initiative. And the more countries that join in that initiative and that share the risk and the benefits of that process, the more likely it is that vaccines can be made available to more people around the world. And we would encourage our member states as much as possible to examine and look at the COVAX platform as a potential way for them both to contribute to the global good of vaccines and also benefit from that uh, global good. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that the other initiatives and I think uh, COVAX platform, the COVAX facility is working very closely with those other initiatives. And we thank those countries who have already indicated that they would be uh, working to make their vaccine available uh, on a global basis as well uh, as part of uh, national protection. I don't know if the DG wants to add. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's, that's a very important question. You have uh, covered uh, it extensively. Just would like to stress some of the areas. 
Um, as you know, Kai, when we uh, launched the um, WHO and Partners, the ACT Accelerator, uh, it was with two objectives. One is accelerating development of uh, products, be it vaccine or therapeutics or uh, diagnostics. And also, second objective was fair distribution, access to those who, who uh, may not afford uh, to have the vaccine, which is uh, actually your question. And to that end, um, you know, together with the steering group, uh, uh, WHO, Gavi, CEPI, Global Fund, World Bank, and other partners, uh, we have developed uh, the allocation framework, which is being finalized. Um, but for a fair distribution, and especially access to the poor and those who cannot afford, the most important element will be political commitment, especially by our leaders. Um, and with political commitment, of course, um, uh, that's the only way you can get, uh, you know, fair distribution. But one of the worrying uh, patterns we see is uh, some countries moving the other direction. Of course, more and more countries are joining uh, the um, uh, benefits, the advantages of making this a global public good. I mean the vaccine, making the vaccine a global public good. But we see, if not many, but some countries uh, going the reverse direction. And when there is no consensus on having uh, this vaccine a global public good, uh, it could be um, actually be uh, owned by those who have money and those who cannot afford it uh, may not have access to the vaccines. And as you know, Kai, many countries are now calling, many leaders, and there was a recent article I remember in OPED um, some leaders have already uh, have called and um, stressed the importance of making, when available, a vaccine or therapeutics a, a global public good. And we want a ground swell of political leaders believing in um, making uh, a vaccine or therapeutics a global uh, public good. And this should not be considered as a charity to those who cannot afford. The advantage of using fairness or access uh, to also poor countries is the world can really be lifted up and lift itself out of this pandemic together, which can speed up the economic uh, recovery. And the world, unless it's opened up in its major part, I mean, unless the whole world is opened up uh, in this globalized world, it will be uh, delaying the uh, economic uh, recovery, and that means more actually damage from lack of uh, fast economic recovery. That can again impact not only on um, continuing the pandemic, but also its impact on other uh, health problems, and not only health, but uh, continued uh, damage on the livelihoods of um, uh, citizens. So um, it's, it's very, the most important element here is global political commitment and a consensus on this by all uh, leaders uh, to, to really, truly uh, commit uh, to uh, using vaccines or any product as a global public good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. The next question goes to Natalie from China Global Television Network. Natalie, can you unmute yourself and please go ahead? Hi there, can you hear me? Very well, please go ahead. Great, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I'm just curious about if there's any updates from the WHO team uh, in China, and as well, if there's any reactions from the WHO over um, all different countries shifting their policies on wearing face masks, some countries requiring it, others not so much, what the WHO's response to that is. Thank you very much. Well, I, that's two questions, but I'll tell you there's no update on the China mission, so we can go to your second question. I think Maria's ready to answer that. 
So thanks, thanks for the question. So WHO has always uh, supported the use of masks um, as part of a comprehensive strategy for COVID-19. Uh, first and foremost, focusing on health workers, um, ensuring that they have proper uh, PPE, including face masks, eye protection, gloves, gowns, et cetera, when caring for, for patients. And of course, the use of respirators when dealing with airborne genera aerosol generating procedures. Um, with regards to the use of masks for the general community, uh, we've always recommended the use of, of medical masks for people who are ill and for individuals who are caring for those. And then there has been a shift um, in uh, uh, looking at the potential use of masks for other people in, in populations, um, including people who cannot do physical distancing to wear a fabric fabric mask where we have uh, put out guidance on what a fabric mask uh, will look like um, in terms of the different layers. Um, what we are hearing now are um, changes in policies from many governments um, who are applying the, the use of masks as part of a comprehensive strategy, particularly in areas where you have active transmission and particularly in areas where you cannot do physical distancing. Um, so what we're hearing uh, quite a lot about is the use of masks in shops, the use of masks in public uh, transportation, um, and, and things like that. So again, we support um, the use of masks as one of the tools that can be put in place. However, it is not a substitute for other public health measures that also must be in place. You cannot substitute the use of a mask for hand hygiene, for cleaning your hands. You cannot substitute the use of a mask for physical distancing. You cannot substitute the use of a mask for testing, finding cases, for contact tracing, for quarantining cases. So all of this has to be done together as part of a comprehensive approach. Um, but again, we, we do support leaders um, in taking those decisions and using this as part of the approach to, uh, to tackling COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kirchhoff. Uh, so the next question goes to Simon Eteba from Africa today. Simon, could you please unmute yourself and go ahead? Can you hear me? Very well, Simon, please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba from Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. More than 720,000 people have contracted COVID-19 in Africa, and 15,000 of them have died so far. South Africa, one of the richest countries in Africa, with more than 364,000 cases and 5,000 deaths, now accounts for more than half of all the cases in Africa and over 30% of all the fatalities. In fact, there are now more than 500 new cases in South Africa every hour or more than 12,000 every day. Yet, South Africa was among the first countries in Africa to impose the WHO recommended lockdown, shutdown, wearing of face masks, hand hygiene, contact tracing, and treatment. I was wondering, what else can South Africa do right now? And what is South Africa missing? Thank you. So I, I, can, I can perhaps start in, in Mike. I'm on. Yeah. Mike, you might want, you might want to supplement. So I think, um, Simon, that's a, that's a very good question, and, and it's a complex one. Um, and if, you, if we look at all of the measures that South Africa and many countries have put in place, um, it is about you know, being consistent and persistent in, in applying all of these measures. Um, we do know in South Africa um, a lot of the, the outbreak you know, began in some urban centers, um, and now the, the, the uh, virus has moved into to more rural areas, affecting different populations. Um, we know that when a virus enters a country, um, it doesn't enter uniformly across the entire country. It tends to start somewhere and, and take root, um, and, and all of these measures do need to be applied in, in different aspects of it. I think what South Africa is doing, and they have very strong, uh, a robust response, um, they, the, the leadership um, in taking a comprehensive approach, engaging communities, you know, looking at a data-driven approach. Um, we engage quite closely with, with South Africa through our regional office, through our international networks, um, to, be able, to be able to apply what they are learning, to feed back into the response that they have themselves. Um, and it is about you know, continuing to apply all of these measures. Um, they will uh, bring this under control. 
um, as all countries will, you know, in, in applying all of these measures, um, and stay vigilant, stay strong, uh, continue to engage with communities, all, all uh, levels of the community, listen to the community, feedback uh, into your response, and adapt. Be agile and adapt. Mike? <clears throat> Yes, and we are. <clears throat> I know the, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros has been in, in touch directly with uh, very senior colleagues in South Africa, and we are working with our uh, regional office on providing surge support, further high level technical assistance to support South Africa in its response. I think we also need to remember that South Africa got its first cases quite early and it's in a later stage of development uh, of this pandemic. Um, and the disease, when it came into South Africa first, tended to come into, at the beginning, into wealthier areas, and now has become very much established in, 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 in poor uh, areas and townships and rural areas. So therefore, South Africa is experiencing that acceleration. But uh, it's not accelerating any faster than many other countries in eastern and southern Africa, all over Africa. In fact, the South Africa numbers may be large, but they've only increased about 30 percent in the last week. But if you look around the region, uh, at, in the same time, although the numbers are smaller, Kenya has increased 31 percent, Ethiopia 26 percent, Madagascar uh, 50 percent, Zambia 57 percent, uh, Eswatini 32 percent, Zimbabwe 51 percent, Namibia 69 percent, um, and, and, and Botswana 66 percent. And even though the numbers in those other countries are smaller, I think what we're starting to see is a continued acceleration of transmission in a number of countries in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that has to be taken very, very seriously. South Africa may unfortunately be a precursor. It may be a warning for what will happen in the rest of Africa. So I think this isn't just a, a wake-up call for, for South Africa. This really is we need to take what is happening uh, in Africa very, very seriously. Many of those countries exist in the midst of fragility and conflict. Many of them need um, uh, external uh, help and support. But what they need is uh, much more support to community-based interventions um, and much more support to improving clinical pathways so people who are sick get uh, adequate care. And as Sose has said previously, much more support to public health surveillance and being able to put in place the necessary early warning. So, uh, while South Africa is experiencing a very, very severe event, I think it is really a marker of what the continent could face if uh, urgent action is not taken to provide further support. So uh, I think, uh, and we've seen this in other regions, sometimes this, this disease can take off very quickly, and sometimes in other situations it takes off more slowly and then accelerates. And uh, it's difficult to understand fully why that is the case. But I'm very concerned right now that we're beginning to see an acceleration uh, of disease in Africa. And we all need to take that very seriously and show solidarity and support to those countries who may now be experiencing increasing numbers of cases and deaths. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. The next question, it might have to be the last because we're coming toward the end of the time allotted, uh, is, goes to Helen Branswell. Helen, uh, can you unmute yourself and go ahead? Hi, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, I apologize, I missed the beginning of the, um, the briefing. So you may have covered this, but since Dr. Fowl is there, I would like to ask if he could give us any kind of a sense of how things are going on the ground in Ecuador province um, with the new Ebola outbreak. Numbers are available from uh, the Ministry of Health in DRC, but we're not really getting much in, way, in the way of, um, you know, detail on how well or not well the containment effort is going. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Good to meet you again. I have been interacting so many times around Ebola in North Kivu. And uh, as you rightly said, this new outbreak is happening in Ecuador, which is a different context with very limited resources and difficulties to move from one area to another. You have to move from by boat, by helicopter, to make sure that you can implement the right intervention. So. In terms of operation, we have you now seven health zones affected, although six are 
only active right now. It means decentralizing operation to all those help them, making sure that we have all the necessary capacity in terms of investigation, in terms of isolation, treatment, contact tracing, and vaccination. And uh, so we have a good team on the ground composed by Congolese, WHO staff we already had in Congo, some from North Kivu, others from Kinshasa, and a number of partners like uh, MSF, UNICEF, uh, IFRC working around various pillars. So we still have uh, some challenges in terms of alert, mainly alert related to death body, because it's very important to make sure that our surveillance pick up all the alert, not only from the health facilities and alive alert in the community, but also death body. And uh, so we are scaling up, still have important gaps in terms of operation because of the difficulties to move around the area. So we continue monitoring the situation and having a daily briefing from the ground and making sure that all partners scale up in the area of responsibility. So it's challenging in the context of COVID because in the capital city in Kinshasa, many people are focusing on COVID-19. So making sure that they don't, don't play Ebola is extremely important. We need also from the national side to scale up operation in all areas. Thank you. Um, and if I j just might just add some, some of the numbers, Ellen, we've had three new cases over the weekend. We now have 60 uh, Ebola virus. Uh, cases uh, with 56 of those confirmed for probable, including 24 deaths. I think, uh, and as uh, as Sose alluded to, uh, the worrying aspects of, of this response in that there have been cases in 21 health areas across seven health zones. So while the numbers are very low, the disease is quite dispersed. Um, and five or seven of those health zones have had cases in the last four days, which means the disease is active, it's not old. So what we have is active disease uh, in, in, f in five health zones uh, across a wide geographic area. Uh, again, worrying is that there are still nine cases who are still in the community and there are real challenges in terms of community engagement and convincing people to come for care in Ebola treatment centres. And of the overall period of terms of exposures, and again, this may go back to the whole issue of case finding and contact tracing and getting the information you need to know where and what the transmission factors are. It is interesting to me that in this case, in the most extreme situation of logistics, uh, probably in, in the world, uh, the data that comes in daily from the surveillance teams you know, tells us that for the people who have been exposed um, uh, over the, 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 the last 21 days, for example, the exposures, but over one in three people have been exposed at a funeral event. Uh, uh, just over 10% have been, 11% have been exposed through nosocomial or in the, in the healthcare system. Um, and, 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 and a lot uh, further number of people uh, uh, have been exposed in a family context. So the information you glean from case investigation and contact tracing tells you who's at risk. And we're able to say for a very remote part of Congo, the big risk factor in this particular clusters of cases is funeral practice and we're working very closely with communities then to really work with them on the funeral process and on engaging with them on how to make that practice safer. It is very hard to engage uh, in generalities. When you work with communities, you must be able to engage on specifics. Getting good data from case and cluster investigation gives you the specific data that allows you to identify the risk factors and then engage positively with communities on how to reduce those risk factors. This is epidemiology and public health in action. If we can do this in a remote, remote part of Congo, if we could do this in, in the middle of a war zone in North Kivu, we can do this for COVID-19. It is not impossible. Many countries have demonstrated that uh, all over the world. So I think uh, even though we don't have perfect data from the field, and so they can speak to some of the challenges we face logistically and operationally, the fact that we have these data, we know where our problems are in the field. We know where our hotspots are. We know what's driving transmission in those communities. And that allows us and gives us the basis to intervene and, uh, and to make a difference. So while the situation in Congo remains of concern, what reassures me at the moment is that we're improving in community engagement. There are many partners on the ground. 
Uh, and again, we'd like to thank our partners, particularly in the Red Cross movement and others who once again are working with local teams in terms of safe and dignified burial, our colleagues in UNICEF who are working on communications, our colleagues in the UN system working on coordination, the World Food Programme working on uh, logistics and support to base camps, but most of all, the frontline health workers of Congo, the Congolese doctors, nurses, hygienists, community engagement specialists who make up the vast majority of the front line in this response. And uh, again, our thanks to the government, the Ministry of Health and the Institut National de Recherche Biologique, INRB, for their leadership in this response. And thank you, Helen, for your question, which really ties together much of what we have been trying to get across today. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Tedros for final words. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to all who have uh, joined today. Uh, and um, look forward to seeing you. I think the next will be on uh, Thursday. Thank you. <laughs>